Hello. Hello. To start off with, would you like to just say your name and where you are, please? My name is Carolyn Lukensmeyer, and I am in Washington, DC. Okay. And the first question for you is, who are you as a human being? And that can be any aspect of yourself you'd really like to share, but maybe some passions, um, values, qualities about yourself. Well, I guess one of the things that I suppose this is a philosophic question, but I actually believe that all human beings enter this world with some qualities or even talents that are actually, I might say God given with a small G and anybody can put whatever spiritual religious framework they want. But I, in my case, I feel blessed that I came into this world with a very large, almost outsized, it felt when I was young, sense of responsibility to leave the world in a better place than I found it, to make a contribution to making a better world for all. And that just has been a driving motivation in me before I could talk, before I had any idea how, what my life path would be. And I think there are two other things that I would say also, or a couple other things that are just, that's what I came in with. It is the human being that was placed on this earth at this time to play a purpose in some grand scheme. The second thing is I, from the time I was very young, I wouldn't have had the right words, but I had a driving sense that another of my responsibilities was to be as whole a human being as I was capable, possibly capable of being. Which fast forwarding a bit meant when I first was exposed to Gestalt, philosophy, theory, and practice, I felt like I'd come home. It was the first psychological theory that ever completely embraced and embodied holism as a core principle of the theory and the work. And the other thing I would say that was deep, deep inside me. And I take credit for the way I've carried it in my life, but the profoundness of its existence in me, I do not take credit for. I was gifted with that upon entering. And that was a sense of the importance of integrity. And in my case, that was challenged very early in my life. I grew up in a very small town in Iowa in a very large multi-generational family. And my particular parents, both mother and father, unlike the generations before them, ended up having a conversion experience as born again Christians. And that in the small town that I grew up in was the group that was experienced by the larger commission, committee, excuse me, community as different. So my, in the way that particularly young teenage girls are pretty vicious about what it takes to be in the in crowd, the price of really being in the in crowd in my life experience at that age when it is so, so important was that I make fun of my parents and their religion. I was born in 1945. That kind of fundamentalist Christianity required of its members no makeup, no dancing, no movies, cannot cut your hair. So in addition to the way in which there was pressure about reacting to who my parents and the religion was, I really looked different and had some constraints on what I could do with my peer group. Again, it was a very, very small community. So the fact that I was very intelligent, I was a fabulous baritone horn player, I set the record for the 100 yard dash in the state of Iowa. So it wasn't possible for that group to completely exclude me, but the pressure, again, literally, to make fun of my own parents, to make fun of the religion they practiced, and I just never did it. And again, I, it actually brings emotion to me now that cost me a lot, and I know that I can and should take some credit for the choice I made to hold to it. But I wanna to convey to you that the level of depth in which integrity means something to me, 
I didn't come from me originally. It is mm. how I came in. And if I fast forward, I've spent 30 years now working on the issue of the state of democracy in the United States of America. And I think anyone listening to this, whatever corner of the earth they're on, would actually understand that for someone who that is such a core piece of who I am, to now watch how our elected officials, the majority leader of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, 147 members who voted against certifying the Biden election, the level of hypocrisy that those men and women are acting on on a daily basis, continuing to erode and threaten our democracy is pretty difficult for me to find any place internally to be compassionate about whatever it is that makes them need to do what they're doing. In mm -hmm. fact, I'd be the first to say, although that is part of my path of doing that around the big divisions, I guess I'd have to acknowledge I actually can't find that space with those people. It's one thing for ordinary people to be caught up in the cult of Trump and why they do that and be scared of being vaccinated. But for people who hold that much power to knowingly lie on a day-to-day -day basis in order to just maintain the power they have and gain more power is anathema to me and completely unacceptable for a human being to do. It sounds almost physically painful. Actually, from time to time, it is physically painful. Now, I've allowed myself to go just where my mind went, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, I guess I'd say one more thing about, uh, I believe I came in with, and that's part of why I was put on this earth, of a deep fascination of the juxtaposition of human behavior and what happens to human beings in the systems in which they are operating. That can be a family system, that can be an organizational system, that can be a community system, that can be a national system, a global system, but it is that interplay between human behavior and the structure and processes and signals of the systems that we humans create. None of those were given to us writ large. We have created all of the ones we're functioning in. But it is that juxtaposition and understanding how change occurs in the interconnectedness that has been a driving force in my life since I was born into a multi-generational family who it seems for whatever reason, my role from a very early age was to offer mediation, was to offer a way for the space for more difference to be absorbed. And although where and how I do it has changed over seven decades or six and a half decades, I've been working on that for a long, long time. Okay. Well, you mentioned, you know, your experience sort of in those teenage years, but I'm wondering what comes to mind as a particular event, or a little bit more you'd like to say about any set of circumstances that you would say have really defined you. Well, actually, I think of lots of them. Uh, one that that have really defined me. I think to me, I would say as one moves through life and as I've moved through my life, certain experiences actually blow apart fixed conceptual frameworks or, cult or catapult you to a higher level of consciousness. Um, and the one that popped into my mind just the moment you asked the question was, you know, again, I, my view is that human beings largest moments for very significant change in who am I in the world happen at birth and the family you're born in happen at the coming of age time, the time in which you move from adolescence into adulthood. And then at those moments in your life where you make big life decisions that are either hugely positive and filled with wonder and hope and inspiration, like choosing your life partner, or those moments in time when in fact your world is crushed. And those of us who are fortunate go through those identity changes 
out of those life experiences that mostly happen on the positive side. And those of us who are a little less fortunate in terms of the struggle to keep our sense of identity and integrity are those that come out of experiences at those critical stages that crush our sense of self. So the one that came to mind when you spoke, um, I came of age in the, I was born in 1945. So I came of age in the 60s and 70s. And in the 60s, I, I was a student at the University of Iowa. The University of Iowa had a very moderate, politically speaking, undergraduate school because it actually attracted mostly young people from the Midwest. But it had such outstanding scholarly work in so many arenas, English literature, journalism, medicine, law, that the graduate student population, history was another one, came from all over the United States. So the graduate population actually was probably dominated by people from the West Coast and the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So nobody would ever remember this because the other things that happened later in the 60s were much more dramatic. But the very first ever draft card was burned in front of the student union at the University of Iowa. And it was burned by a very radical uh, uh, graduate student in history. I myself was one of three elected leaders, student leaders on the university campus. And again, coming from a moderate political background, but that event woke me up to a different way of taking in data, of listening and understanding what the meaning of the Vietnam War was in who we are as a country and who the government was both in terms of what it was doing in Southeast Asia, but as we later could all articulate the lies that it perpetrated on all of its citizens. Mm -hmm. Just following that track at that age, I became a very dedicated anti-war activist. I by then was actually working on my own PhD at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio in the field of organization design and development. But I cared enough about what was going on that at a certain, I feel like this is too much detail, Heather, but um, one of the cohort members in the class I was in was a Catholic priest from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And about two months into our program, Harry walked into our class in the morning and said, who else will go to Vietnam with me out of the blue? He then gave us the background, a woman named Marjorie Hamilton, a totally lay person, Catholic woman from Minneapolis, St. Paul, who created an organization called uh, Clergy, Clergy and Laity Concerned. And she had built up so, <clears throat> so much respect by both the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese that she actually had an observer seat at the Paris Peace Talks. This was the time when Richard Nixon was claiming that he was going to uh, Vietnamize the war. He was gonna move it back over into control. I'm not sure I'm saying the right term anymore. And he claimed that if we pulled out of Saigon, 100,000 Catholics, Catholics would be slaughtered immediately. Marjorie had enough information that she was sure that wasn't true. But she also knew that to get members of Congress to take it seriously, real social science data had to be collected on the ground. So myself, Harry Burry, and another colleague of that era, Jeff, Jeffrey Voorhees, committed to actually going to Vietnam. We spent six weeks there in country eventually and spent time preparing to go. And this, this is a one moment when my understanding of what it means to be a human being and what information one has to have to have the capacity to be understanding and empathetic of other whole groups of um, other human beings was just exploded. We did a minimum of language training just to get by. And some of the other people you've interviewed will know this immediately. But Vietnam, Vietnamese as a language, as the root languages of many Southeast Asian languages, actually has no word meaning I and no word meaning you. 
Mm. When you try to translate, for example, when I was meeting people in Vietnam, if I was meeting a woman who was about my age, you would translate what she said to me, assuming a positive connection. It to the best closest you can come to putting it in English is we are sistering. So it'd be a gerund phrase acknowledging our familiar relationship. Well, given I was already into my graduate studies, I deeply understood theories of group dynamics. I'd already been leading many, many group and organizational interventions. And it's like, oh my God, everything we learn in Western theoretical framework about how groups form, about how individuals submerge their identity to groups doesn't apply to billions of people who grow up in a language and conceptual structure where their initial identity is a we, not an I. And at least in Southeast Asia, that is completely a familial, the, your place in a family. Mm -hmm. So that was a little mind blowing experience for you there? Changed my consciousness, changed <laughs> the way I read literature and research, changed the way I design interventions in people's lives, in organizations' lives. So that's one example. I fear I probably did too much detail, but the bottom line is I could go through my life and answer your question that several other examples like that, that then did enlarge my sense of who I am as a human being and what it means to be actually have enough of your own sensation processes and presence available that you have the capacity to take in difference at so many, many different levels. You know, the tragedy in terms of, and I'll speak now in my own country, but much of what I'm saying is true in lots of Western society. The way in which we are educated, the way in which we have had the privilege of affluence in large part, and of course, poverty and racism, et cetera, I'm in this moment, of course they are there. But so many people, have been able to walk through their lives without a demand on them to feel or to sense or to understand difference at very basic levels. So that they are actually fairly desensitized to what it even means to be a human being. And certainly not in their current state able to be empathetic or compassionate with human beings who are distinctly different than they are. And that's what leads to a lot of the divisiveness. That's what leads to people seeing one another as competitive rather than having a capacity and slowly over your life, building up to a sense, no, your difference isn't a threat to me. Your difference has the capacity of making me an even larger palette as my human beingness than I was before. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna have really sophisticated answers to a lot of what you're saying, but I am appreciating it. I am taking in what you're saying and I agree with a lot of it. It's, it is definitely, it, it's a task that seems a lot more complicated than most people want to get into because it makes them uncomfortable. Finding difference and growing into it rather than pushing it away or squashing it in the other. Well, and, and what I've been blessed to spend a lifetime professionally is understanding how to design the spaces, both the physical and psychological spaces that enable people to move as far as they can to their, as Abraham Lincoln would have said, our better angels rather than our baser instincts. I mean, that's the horrendous political divide we're now in the country. The two sides see each other as evil. Well, as long as I'm demonizing you, as long as I've defined you as evil, there's no possibility of us ever reweaving 
a space in our community that we both feel safe and equally respected. And what's missing in that context is the way human beings have lost the perspective that this dimension of good to evil exists inside every one of us. We all have the capacity to behave out of our better angels or our baser instincts. And unfortunately, in our mass media society now, both in traditional media and in social media, most human beings are receiving more signals that push them to their baser instincts and less signals that are pushing to them, them to their better angels. But any person who's, who has even a spark of openness to learning, if they are given a structure, a process, a set of signals, a real belief in their own ability to have control over what they take in and what they don't take in, it's actually easier for most people to take the first steps toward healing those wounds than most of us believe. No, is it easy if I'm over here isolated watching Fox News every night and everybody around me in my life still says Biden isn't the legally elected president of the United States? Of course, I'll never get out of it then. But if I'm in a context that makes it safe for me to hear data that comes from a source I actually do trust that for the first time plants the seed, oh my God, maybe I've actually been fed a lie. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to look again. Then it's, that's the hope in the United States of America. I've been doing this work in the country in terms of the state of our democracy for more than three decades. Mm -hmm. and despite despite the horrendous situation we're in right now, I actually still feel hopeful if I keep my focus on the collective American people. If I put my focus on the mass media, if I put my focus on the dominant way in which corporations are spending resources, if I put my focus on the United States Congress, if I weren't by character a very optimistic person, I would be depressed out of my mind. But as I've watched how this is progressing, the American people in the year 2020, despite the pandemic, made it, their behavior individually and collectively, made it the most inclusive, largest turnout in voting that has ever happened in American history. If that had not been true in 2020, two things would be a fact today. Donald Trump would still be the president and we would have already lost more of the institutional underpinnings of our democracy. So now you ask me, and this is a real question right now in my country, all the work that's being done to do voter suppression of people of color, all the work that's being done to remove from their positions the way elections have been run across the country as a nonpartisan process since the beginning, that work, plus whatever happens in the 2020 election, we could, excuse me, the 20 fragility of our fundamentally are we a democracy is very, very close, depending on what happens in 2022. And given the time frames we have, yes, there are some lawsuits that can help. Yes, the Department of Justice may move on a few states that are clearly already violating federal statutes in the United States. But the thing that makes me believe we will make it is that some combination of elements when the time comes will create again in 2022, the largest, most inclusive voter turnout that's happened in the country. If that's true, we will then be slowly on a trajectory that we can pull back some of the social norms or recreate some of the social norms. We can solidify arenas of rule of law that we didn't understand could be broken so easily. I guess you know what I do every day now, don't you? I'm definitely getting a sense of your passions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm kind of sure that all of these things end up intertwining. Um, you've mentioned a couple times how often or how long you've been doing things. So I'm wondering how you experience this time in your life and age. Well, that's a surprising different direction. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 76 years old. I've been seriously working 
since I was 11 or 12. I came from very poor economic background. Um, and it's, it's felt like the right thing to do. Um, a year ago, just about now, a year ago, I gave up my organizational leadership by choice. I found my successor who's doing a great job. But I had come to, the, for 30 years, I'd been working in the nonprofit sector. So I was individually responsible with help, of course, but the buck stopped at my desk to raise the funds in a nonprofit organization to pay for a lot of people's salaries. And of course, to deal with all of the human issues that arise in working relationships. They, of course, we had a team that worked with them, but in the end, if it got naughty and difficult, it was at my desk. And although I was very good at both of those tasks, I had come to the place where they were no longer generative of me. They were, I could feel they were draining energy rather than replenishing energy, which had happened for a long, long time. So, but the way the world works, particularly in the type A uh, ambition and accomplishment is everything United States of America, once you leave the organizational position, it's a big question mark. Will my voice still be heard? Will I still be invited to the tables that I've had influence for 30 years? And I'm now in a year's process of transition about that. And I'm very pleased with two things that are happening. And I also do feel the loss of the structural position that by definition got me invited to the tables that I needed to be present at. So the two things that are, I'm very blessed to be able to say are true is a lot of young leaders who are themselves more holistic in the way they walk through the world than most people my age were when they were 20 and 30, in their 20s and 30s, are actually finding me and asking to be mentored by me. And that is just really a gift. I can't think of anything, and when you're speaking individually, <laughs> that's more important. I'm ready with as open heart and mind and generosity as I can be to give back to people who now need their 30 or 40 years to be in the leadership positions. The second thing is that Two years before I left my organizational leadership, I was a member of the commission called the Democratic Practice, the Practice of Democratic Citizenship, sponsored by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which some of your listeners or some people who watch this YouTube will know, but most will not, was the first academy like that formed in the United States in the late 1700s by Ben Franklin, John Adams, all those brilliant, people who understood the uniqueness of what the possibilities of a country based on ideas rather than a geography, rather than a religion, but at the core ideas. And their proposition was that whoever were the elected leaders, they would need access to science. They would need access to facts. They would need access to truth and knowledge. Well, obviously that's a little more relevant right now than it has been for almost 200 years in terms of how far we've walked away from that institutionally. Anyway, I am now working on that commission's implementation. And in case any of the people who are listening to this would like to, the report we put out in June of 2020 is called Our Common Purpose. And you can find that report at www dot a m a c a d dot org slash our common purpose and it is a set of structural recommendations and behavioral cultural recommendations that all have to work in tandem with one another to both protect democracy and strengthen democracy so the fact that even though i've left organizational leadership I still have a position on which to work on, as you called it, my core path. In fact, I would say, you know, as a kid, I used to be envious of those kids in my classes that knew they wanted to be a doctor, knew they wanted to be a farmer, knew they wanted to play in the NFL or whatever it was they knew. I didn't, I didn't have a clue. 
And it was sometime, quite some time later, when it really, I came to understand that I was put on this earth to make a contribution to the evolution of democracy. And that needs to happen globally, but my particular place to plant my feet and do the spade work and blood, sweat and tears is here in the United States. And I mean, this, this response comes out of a question about age, which is really interesting to me in that it just seems like your life is more complex and richer and is evolving. Yeah, I think that's true. I, what's different that I would have to acknowledge, and then I, there's something I really want to talk about since this is humans in gestalt, mm -hmm. but what's different, okay, unusual for a woman my age, very mm -hmm. unusual actually. Some of my strongest sense of self-confidence actually came from my physical capabilities. <laughs> Very unusual for a woman born in 1945. Anyway, so for the first time in the last, and it's not just this year, but the last couple of years, for the, I mean, you, aging is a process of coming to a new equilibrium about your physical, your mental, your spiritual, emotional. And then my experience is, you, is you're on that equilibrium for quite a long time. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I lost mm -hmm. something else. Remember I told you I set the record for the 100 yard dash in, mm -hmm. in, in, my, in high school. Well, one time while teaching a program at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland, a young woman who had huge talent, but was, I could tell, really struggling with feeling competitive with me and therefore not able to really fully be open to me as a teacher. She one day blithely said, I want to challenge you to a race. So I said, sure, why not? So we went out to the street. We did it. And she beat me. So at 26, I already understood I had lost some physical capacity. But that it was minor. That was nothing. So I finally come to the place in my life where the combination, it's all aging, of shifts in hormones, shifts in bones, shifts in... I have to now, to keep up the level of physical health that I want in my life, have to put a lot more time and energy into, and even then, the best I can do is maintain. I just, you know, I'm aging. What can I say? Hopefully, gracefully, most of the time. Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Well, another aspect of yourself, I am interested in what you wanted to get to, but I, I also would like to know, because you said, you know, a woman of, how do you experience and understand yourself within your gender or as a woman? That's a wonderful question. And I thought of something about that when you asked me before, I can't remember your exact question, but when I chose to talk about Vietnam, as I said before, we are all products and deeply influenced of the larger culture that is occurring as we come of age. That's the first time we've separated enough from our families that we're putting, not for everybody, but for people who are lucky, that step is behind us. And we're now looking at ourselves in the context of gender in the larger culture. So I came of age in the second wave of feminism in the United States of America. The feminine theme, Gloria Steinem, the whole nine yards. So yeah, gender, the dissertation I wrote, I actually wrote about the concept of gender identity. And at least as I researched it at that point, that term had never shown up any place in academic literature before I wrote my dissertation. Well, it's too bad I didn't write an article. And then I, anyway, but the bottom line is, yeah, gender is a big deal. So the, when, I, when I finished my PhD, this is the best way to tell why it was a big deal. My husband was still working on his degree. I knew he'd want to move out of Cleveland when he was done. So I knew if I took a job, then we'd be in a da 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 about where we were going to live. So I chose just to hang out a shingle and do consulting. In the mid 70s, you could do that as a generalist. Now people would laugh at you. By the time you finish graduate school, you're either doing it specifically in health or you're doing it specifically in energy or you're doing so. But the times were the times. 
So I, at the end of my graduate studies, had three burning questions about this. Remember, I told you what I cared about from before I could talk mm -hmm. was what happens in the intersection between human behavior and systems and how they work. Right. So my three burning questions were, what's the difference between organizations that are created, conceived, and led in the public sector and in the private sector? And in the mid 70s worldwide, private sector and public sector were two easily identified different arenas. Now those boundaries have been completely schmurgled. There's a ton of different examples of private public enterprises. You, you couldn't ask the questions that I asked in 1975 in that way. It wouldn't be real. It'd be real in a very, very few places in the world today. Mm -hmm. The second question that just was burning in me was, so what's the difference just as a function of scale? So what can you do in an organization of 30 people from a management point of view and a structure point of view and a design point of view? 30 people, 300 people, 3,000 people, 30,000 people, 300,000 people. Uh, and at that time, there was some real academic research done trying to identify those differences. The company that stood out that had learned the most and embedded it in how they work was Gore-Tex, the company that makes great rain gear. And then I don't know why, but that as an academic research question dropped out of, it just didn't get pursued for a long time. It now scalability is pursued in every which way, but mostly dominated about products and about reach on the internet. Mm -hmm. which are two very important areas, but they're not where most human activity is taking place. If you put mm -hmm. the total collective of human activity in on the table. The third question that drove me, and it's why my dissertation had a concept called gender identity in it, was what's the difference between organizations that are conceived, created, and led by women compared to organizations that are conceived, created, and led by men. Now mm. I started looking at this in 1974, 75. The organizations that people in that period thought as women or dominated organizations, nursing, teaching, yes, lots of women, but they weren't conceived by, they weren't created by, and they mostly weren't managed by. Yes, mm. the employee population was dominantly women, but that was it. So what began to show up in the culture in that mid seventies were those organizations that were created out of women's consciousness raising groups. Hmm. One of my professors, Nathan Grunstein, a brilliant man said that women's consciousness raising groups of that area era were the actual first new invention of a group slash organizational process that the world had seen in some time. Out of those women's consciousness raising groups, you will, as soon as I say it, recognize that the first rape crisis centers showed up in the United States, the first women's battered shelters showed up in the United States, none of which as organizations existed prior to that time. Right. So here I am, fresh out of graduate school, running my own consulting. Some days I'm consulting with Exxon, Republic Steel, Monsanto Chemical, and some days I'm consulting pro bono with the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center. And I did that for 13 years in terms of learning as much as I possibly could learn about this intersection between behavior and systems, starting on those three questions, but of course, learning a ton more along the way. Hmm. As long as we've gone this far, I'm going to do a little bit more about where that took me, because what I want to talk to you about, because I think for why you're in, why I'm choosing to be interviewed by you <laughs> is, or as responding to your invitation, I think the particular way that I have been a leader in moving what was traditionally and as it was created, Gestalt theory, therapy, blah, blah, blah as an intrapersonal, intrapsychic, interpersonal, and occasional group, but really the group was usually just there to help the individual, to actually transitioning to how do you apply the Gestalt philosophy, methodology, 
and theory really to groups, really to organizations and to social action work. Mm -hmm. And yes, I actually think there are more people in Europe, South Africa, some places in Latin America that got to this link between Gestalt and social action more quickly than was true in a lot of Western Europe and or the United States. But a certain level of sophistication of how it's done and a certain level of how to train people how to do it. I was one of five people at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland that created the Organization and Systems Development Program. Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to say more about that because I think what I'm meeting is more and more, uh, not just Gestalt, but people who have been academics and people who have spent most of their time as therapists and in counseling rooms, who actually at a later stage in their life are saying, wait a second, I know, I, I know where, that the world is at an inflection point at this point in time. I know that this is a moment in which major system change could happen. And I, it's not that I wanna give up the classroom or the consulting you know, the counseling room, but I'd like to shift and have more of my energy go into this systems work. So I think the need and the desire for people to be trained in this work right now is huge. And we don't have very many touchstones for, okay, if I'm teaching political science at Harvard and I want to shift to this, who do I talk to about how I do that? Or if I'm teaching cultural anthropology at a community college in El Paso, Texas, and I see what's happening along the border, and I know that I could help people do something about getting out of their other rising people coming across the border, how do I do that? So mm -hmm. that... That's where I said I wanted to go, <laughs> but no, no. And, and I think I can definitely hear it going there because yeah. you're talking about collectives and yes. emergence of projects in response to the need of the collectives. Okay, so I sort of went there without fully responding to your gender question. Um, And I said that I was going to give you a little more about biography, which I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the consulting time, I had a contract with the state of Ohio through the governor's office. I was one of eight, a team of eight consultants that was hired by the governor to create a statewide strategic plan. Governments still today mostly have only siloed strategic plans. Each agency has one and nothing by structure crosses the, the silos. Right. Celeste was a very interesting and very visionary and very good manager. And he knew that he had to create something that would force more interaction across departments on specific goals. Well, the team of us that did that, by definition, met everybody in his administration that was anybody, cabinet members, deputy cabinet members, top civil servants. And at the end of that process, Celeste had understood who I was. By that time, I had an amazing track record about change in large bureaucracies. So he asked me to begin to do consulting work on contract with just he, his governor's staff, and the cabinet members. I did that for three years in the first term. At the end of the that third year, I said to him that even if I knew the last year would be a lot about getting reelected because I learned that much about political systems. So I wrote him a memo. And this is another thing I would say, this is interesting about things I came in with. I've been comfortable speaking truth to power since I was five, <laughs> four, three, two, one, whatever. And in my career, it has taken me a very long way. And in my career, it has cost me a lot. Most times I made good judgments of where the risk could be absorbed, but you can't always uh, sense and perceive the level of insecurity within which you are attempting to have an impact in that way. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is I wrote the governor a very long memo and I said, I've loved working with you. I believe in your administration, but, and I hope you get reelected, but even if you're reelected, I don't, I'm not going to do this work anymore because fundamentally we set plans in place and there's not enough 
I don't, I've now said where this is. Um, there's just not enough management capacity in the intersect between in the staff and between in the cabinet that the action plans fizzle and they don't go anywhere. And my whole consulting career, I never ever marketed myself. It was all word of mouth. So I didn't want a big government contract out there that didn't produce anything. Well, much to his credit, he is an amazing human being and a very, very extraordinary politician. He called me himself and he said, I'm in Cleveland such and such a date. I want two hours of your time. I want you to go through this memo item by item. And I want you to start by saying, which of these are a function of my management style? Well, let me say in the year 1986, there might have been four governors in the whole United States of America that would have thought of themselves as having a management style. So very unique. Anyway, to make a long story short, he offered me the position to be his chief of staff in his second term when he won. Uh, that made me, I was the first woman chief of staff in the state of Ohio. There's only, that was in, I served from December of 1986 to January of 1991. There has only since then been one more. Hmm. When I finished that job, well, number one, it gave me an unbelievable on the job training experience about government and politics in the United States of America. Ohio was, used to be a real swing state, it's not anymore. There was enough money because of the corporations were the way it flowed, special interests. So, I mean, it was an extraordinary on the job experience. And at the end, I often said to people who are sophisticated about organizations, the only thing I regretted, and I meant this sincerely, <laughs> The only thing I regretted in that four years was that I didn't understand as much about how to use the positional power of chief of staff on day one as I understood on the last day. Right. So the bottom line is I went from there, I went back to consulting, I got a call to help with the Clinton-Gore transition, I went to work for Clinton-Gore. Um, ran a cabinet retreat with a colleague of Gore's named Jane Hopkins, even before the administration took their positions. I then went to work for Gore on reinventing government, which gave me the same capacity to deep dive into federal agencies that I'd had to deep dive into Ohio. I wasn't in Washington very long <laughs> before I realized that what I had watched that was wrong about how politics and government and the rest of the world interacts with each other had problems in Ohio was child's play to what goes on in Washington. And I left out an important step, which is once I left the chief of staff job, I gave speeches where anybody would allow me to speak in which I had two sections to the speech. I said, I leave this job more optimistic than I ever could have imagined that I would be about how much easier it is to change a large public bureaucracy than it is to change a large private bureaucracy. And you will recognize that we were just going into the 80s when it was, it had already started in the 70s, government should be more like a business, government should be more like a business. And there are ways in which that was true. But I had the creds to stand in front of anybody, given that I had consulted with Exxon worldwide, given that I, I could stay there and I could go point for point with anybody who wanted to challenge me about why what I was, what had to be in place in the public bureaucracy for it to happen. There was no magic to it. These elements had to be in place. But if those elements were in place, you could move the state of Ohio quicker than you could move Monsanto Chemical Company. That was the first half of the speech. And fun to give and always got a lot of reaction and a lot of learning. The second half of the speech was, I leave this position more shaken about the fragility, I don't know if that's the word I used, more shaken about the issues facing our democracy than I ever could have imagined. And I had 10 points in which I talked about. And I don't write speeches out. And years later, when I was leading America Speaks, everybody, well, where's that speech? And I finally found it. But the 10 points were things like too much money in politics, 
too much, too much power for special interests. No place for citizens' voice to be meaningfully expressed after you're elected except in poll data. So 10 points. So it was a system description. And too many Americans not engaging. So the human behavior was one of the 10 points. Okay, so then I end up in Washington, then I end up with Gore's reinventing governor government, and then I'm asked to come over to the White House. So I end up personally with a desk in the West Wing of the White House. So given who I am and what my career had been, this is like the epitome of where one would think I would want to be. And that was true, except that it didn't take me too long once I was there and inside the parameters that I was given to work in, I accomplished. And then I laid out some conditions about the next step that was offered to me that had all to do with integrity. Those conditions were not met, so I left. And I left in March of 1995 to start America Speaks, which was all about bringing citizen voices to the table in terms of what the collective American voice was envisioned to be in our founding documents. And yes, I know women were left out. Yes, I know African-Americans were three-fifths of a person. Yes, I know indigenous people were just being killed by genocide. Yes, 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 yes. And we have made progress over time on what was a real commitment and belief in the idea that human beings are capable of governing themselves. However, a single human being on their own isn't capable of governing him or herself unless the structures and conditions and contexts and supports are, because we aren't separate from anything. We aren't separate from nature. We aren't separate from the city systems that we're embodied in. So this is not just something I do by myself. And then you can take what I just said up to the real systems level. So what I understood, was the rod in the system was already embedded enough that, you know, back in that day, which is 93, 94, the nexus between the power systems, big corporations, big media, executive branch, White House, national media, there were a lot of power systems that were in play and they were, they were making decisions that satisfied a pretty big group of people particularly people employed by all those things. Well, we're now down to that the decisions are made dominantly to satisfy about 1% of the American population. So that element of who are decisions being made by and for whom has dramatically gotten worse in the last 40 years. Okay, so what I understood in January of 1991 and for sure solidified by March of 94, was that if real systemic change that was gonna re-equal the playing field, that was gonna open it up for what systemic racism is and genocide of the Native Americans means in our founding, it was gonna to have to come with huge pressure from collective voice from outside Washington. Now, if you've followed anything I've said about my career, obviously my whole career was either holding the power high up myself or consulting to the power higher than anybody else. What did I know about grassroots organizing? What did I know about Zippo? But what I know is how you design spaces and processes that bring people together to make collective decisions. And because of my inside government experience, I knew how to connect those conversations to the decision makers. America Speaks, the very first project we ever did, 1998, 1999, social security reform. Our data brought back to the chairs of the Senate Finance Committee, then Charles Grassley, who's still there today, Daniel Moynihan, who has since passed away, House Ways and Means, Charlie Rangel, who's still there today, Bill Archer, who retired to Texas, but in that year knew it was his last term and wanted very, very deeply to reform Social Security. We brought in, we went to all 50 states, we were able to bring data in which said, guess what? People who earn more than $200,000 a year in the United States of America are equally supportive of raising payroll taxes as people who earn $25,000 or $50,000 a year. And that was the big myth, that people that above a certain level of income would go, ah, 
this is going to be on YouTube, isn't it? <laughs> it I is. Better, I better calm down. Anyway, <laughs> the project worked. Within mm -hmm. the next year, Social Security raised pay payroll taxes, the cap mm -hmm. on payroll taxes. We went on to be in New York after 9-11. We brought 5,000 people together to review the plans done by the Lower Manhattan Corporation. The public in mass rejected the plans. Representative of the governor's office, representative of the mayor's office stood on the platform and said, we will start over. New Orleans after Katrina and the flooding, we came in and did what were called community congresses and demonstrated the collective agreement New Orleans City Council, New Orleans mayor, state legislature, governor, that what the priorities for rebuilding should be. And it forced the Bush administration to release the $43 billion that Congress had already appropriated for rebuilding the city. So the bottom line is across all these places, because I received my own Gestalt training at a very young age, I started doing workshops and ended up in the postgraduate training program in Cleveland before I was 25. I was the youngest person ever added to the faculty by all these founding members, the Polsters, the Nevises, Bill Warner, Cynthia Harris, Marjorie Creelman. So this, I, there was a match between the theory and my internal desire to be a whole human being and my age and desire of just lapping in the learning like there was no tomorrow. So mm -hmm. now, of course, when I'm doing America Speaks in New York City, I can't be standing up there teaching Gestalt principles, but the Gestalt principles are embedded in the way the designs were done. And that's, that's where I think there's a huge need to expand the availability of the Gestalt philosophy theory method into making it available to many more people who yes, have to learn a little bit of the language in order to absorb it, embody it, experiment it within themselves, hopefully first, and then bring it into the systems in which they're working. Mm -hmm. And that I, I am interested in hearing how you see these things come together because I have, I would probably say I've never met, I don't know if I have, and I'm just not aware of it. But I don't think I've ever met someone who identifies as a Gestalt person who has been involved in so many systems on so many levels. I mean, the, the complexity of the relationship structures that you're seeing and the depth of your awareness of the power and the inter influence in those systems is really, really interesting to me. And I'm wondering what to do with that, because I, I think about the Gestalt training groups of all of the different institutes that I know, and, and a part of you is almost speaking a different language. Um, it, it's just a level of awareness. It's, it's sort of like the, the, the holographic brain, and you're talking to a, a two-dimensional kind of framework. And I, I'm curious how you pop that depth, that, that dimensionality um, into relationship with Gestalt. I, I don't think that people who are in Gestalt training are simple by any means. I don't wanna give that impression. I think we're often not invited to think and to structure with the depth and complexity that you're talking about. I really appreciate your question, and I think you've said it very well. And because my passion was to make a difference in systems that impact people's lives, that's the career path I followed. And I did, in a very intentional, aware way, bring everything I understood from Gestalt into all of that work. And in every case, the teams that were core my leadership teams doing this work, I brought Gestalt trained people in and we did retreats on an annual basis, specifically in the context we were working. Like in New Orleans, before we went and did that work, we spent a weekend together that had many elements in it, but one of the elements in it was, and how do the things we previously learned about Gestalt, what's unique about this in the most systemically, in the most racist 
the, the racism embedded in the systems in both a more visible and more unvisible way than any place else we've ever worked before. So yes, I actually intentionally did as much as I was capable of doing to articulate and make that possibility of seeing some beautiful, simplest, simple, in the best sense of that word, truths out of Gestalt theory, methodology, and philosophy applicable to the complexity of the city of New Orleans after it was almost destroyed. Now, given what I was doing and what my primary goal was, I've never taken the time to completely back out and say, okay, the one I just told you. So what were the four things I did in those three days when we were together that specifically gave about 100 people and access to things they already knew about, but their possibility of applying them in the context that they were about to enter. And, and to be actually, to be totally candid with you, Heather, um, I think I'm only beginning to understand at this moment, and there've been several, several events or small exchanges that are leading me to this. I actually think it's time for me now to, um, and this is hard for me because I'm a speaker, I'm an activist, and I am a good writer, but it's painful and it's, uh, I, it's I don't slow. Like it. yes, yes, <laughs> I think that might be the painful too, part for you. <laughs> way too slow. Anyway, I actually think something that is important for me to do, and I hope I can find the right supports to do it because I will need supports to do it, is it's now time for me to put in writing some of what I do know how to do and have already learned some of the pieces of the elements of how to train other people how to do them. And one of the, so here's, I'll give you like four crossings that have led me to understanding the importance of this. One was a conversation I had with Irv Poster maybe three months ago. Another was a conversation I had with Malcolm Parlett, who I played a very important role in Malcolm's ever even choosing to get interested in Gestalt. And the last book he's written, Future Sense, there, um, as we talked, th that's a parallel book to a book that I will write, maybe. Malcolm's focusing mainly on what happens on the individual process, but giving many, many stories and examples that if you work backwards are what I'm talking about. The difference in the book would be all of my case examples would be complex, large complex systems. And I do, I, I think Malcolm's book is a great step in the direction that we're just now talking, but it isn't, it won't, it won't help that faculty member that I heard say last night at 5.30, I want to make a difference in the state of Massachusetts. Malcolm's book won't get her there. Which is not a criticism, You're, that's clear. <laughs> I don't know, it's, nothing is universal, right? It's nothing is gonna do everything. So another, I spent the weekend at the beach, um, and the person, one of the people I was with is someone who was, went through training at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. And I believe he said the sixth OSD program. And what's interesting, he's, got, he's gone a whole different direction in healthcare, particularly in the United Nations. And what he articulates is what he learned in going through the OSD program. And he attaches it a lot to me in terms of the examples I was bringing in and the work that I was doing, that he's now done that in his gestalt, in his training, in his consulting practice, but he isn't in a place where he's working with a team or he's trying to teach it to other people, but he said it's completely embodied in me. And therefore the authenticity of it and the existence of it in the system is in fact sense felt and becomes influential in the consulting work 
beyond the specific intervention that I'm doing on strategic planning or that I'm doing on whatever I'm doing. So, and then actually the person who, want, who said to me, Carolyn, you have to be interviewed by Heather. <laughs> I actually called her and I said, so why do I have to be interviewed by Heather? <laughs> and she said to me, because you know something about how you brought Gestalt into changing large complex systems that most people don't understand, hasn't much been written about, and people are hungry to understand. Okay, there it is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I when I just heard you, I, does it come back to scalability? I mean, you have to have those basic felt sense individual awareness. Yes, I, okay, if we let's go back to perception sensing. And again, this will focus on the individual, but to do what I've done in organizations, when you walk into a room of 500 people, you, there is a level on which you are seeing a room of 500 people, but you are simultaneously seeing, interestingly enough, really excellent politicians have this skill way higher than I have it, way higher than I have it, and I'm pretty good. I can talk to 500 people and all 500 feel like I'm talking to them. And a good, more than 50% of them will walk out of the room inspired to take an action they wouldn't have thought of taking before they heard me speak. But Dick Celeste, who I work for, the governor I work for, I could watch him walk into a room of a thousand people and every person in the room felt like he was talking only to them. Bill Clinton was a genius at that. Da, 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 da. So some of that's charisma, but it's, it is how you are using your perceptual and sense systems and then what point you want to make with them. Politicians are dominantly trying to bond the person to them to follow them, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. I, when I do it, am dominantly trying to touch someone in that person's heart, mind, being that was already there but they didn't feel enough support to take the risk of acting in the world differently. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing when I'm consulting. If we're gonna change this system, everybody in this room is gonna behave differently than they did before. And some of the policies and structures of the system are gonna change, but they're not gonna change by themselves. They're gonna change because enough collective agreement conceptually gets supported by enough behavior, by the right levels of power in the system that we can time this in a way that the policy changes, the training is put in place by management, that all the way down the, the chain, we can absorb what is now a new direction for this company, or we can absorb what is now a new policy around banking and redlining and affordable housing for people of color. If we wanna take a real one that could change right now as a result of the George Floyd murder and the amount of white people that have woken up, oh my God, oh my God, systemic racism is real and it is embedded. It is embedded in our political structures, in our banking structures, blah, 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 blah. So when you have this awareness of felt sense, field awareness, you identify systemic structures, you notice them. What do you do? I, I mean, I sometimes ask people, what is the essence of your work? I hear you're focused on democracy. You're one of the most American Americans I think I've ever spoken to in your, your awareness of the historical and the actual functionings of the country that you're talking about. Okay. Um, but what do, what do you do with that in a gestalt frame? That's not an easy question to answer. No, I know that's probably the book that hasn't finished I, I the instructions say. yet. Okay, so, all right, well, let me, I'll try, I'll make an attempt. Um, so the model that I created that we called America Speaks, the model was the following. We've got a, I'll take social security because I talked about it already. No, I'm going to take a different one because it's very relevant to what is the biggest challenges of our time and of sustaining this work. And okay, I'm going to say a preface to this. 
as I've said several times, I'm 76 years old. I've been working in systems change since I, in a conscious way, since I was in my 20s. Right now, and, I, and I've been, I mean, Heather, I've been blessed. What we did in Ohio together, because right things were, many things that the Celeste administration created over two terms in Ohio in the late 80s still exist in Ohio today. Many of it had been wiped out, but many of the systems, policies, and structures that worked better for more people still exist today. That's, I mean, do you know what a gift that is to, in the year 2021, to be able to say something that we did, and it was a large we, I played a critical role in it for four years, is still real today. That, that's pretty incredible. That, that's a question, you know, of legacy and transcendence, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take the last large scale project that America Speaks ever did was called Our Budget, Our Economy. And it was about debt and deficit in the year 2010. And some people on YouTube will remember that the biggest issue in the United States of America's politics in the election year 2010 was budget deficit. That became the Tea Party. That became in the election in 2010 when this group of very radical people entered the House of Representatives for the first time. You looked like you wanted to ask a question. I'm arguing with my dad. <laughs> Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, so what we set up was 3,500 Americans in 19 cities hooked by web and by satellite television. That 3,500 people were demographically representative of the United States of America in the cities they were sit seated in. So the main city where we were broadcasting out of was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So if you look there, the age, the race, the gender, the political philosophy, the where in Philadelphia they lived of the 750 people that were there, it matched, not perfectly, but even random samples don't match perfectly. So that was replicated in the other 18 cities. So MacArthur Foundation gave a social science research grant to a team at Harvard and Berkeley, the largest grant ever given for that kind of work to do a blind match research project. So 3,500 people that matched those demographics city by city by city took a pre-post test and all of our participants took a pre-post test. As you would expect, in the morning, the conservatives, self-identified conservatives said, I will not raise taxes under any circumstances or fees or any other way you can think of getting more money from the American people. The liberals all said, and I won't cut spending, particularly not on entitlements. Well, frankly, a bright fourth grader who looks at the data knows in about 10 minutes that you can't do anything about the deficit in the United States if you don't do both. It takes people wedded to those positions more like an hour, hour and a half of a lot of data in front of them, a freedom to ask questions, pull experts of their political philosophy over to the table, blah, blah, blah. But they get there. By the end of that day, those 3,500 people actually cut $26 trillion from the US debt by 2025. We chose those numbers because the House and Senate had a task force or working group or whatever they called it was supposed to do the same thing. Never got it done. So what was the difference? What the difference was, was the people, once they saw the data, they left their ideological positions because de Tocqueville said this about Americans in 1837. Americans care more about problem solving than they care about ideology. Now in our world today, there's an extreme on the right that may be as big as 12, maybe even 15%. And there's an extreme on the left that now I'm talking about the American people, not members of Congress. I mean, they're in there, but that's just 4, 535 people. There may be something like 10, max 12%. So add those two together, 
you still got 75 or more percent of the American public that given the right context, structure, signals, and supports want to solve the problem more than they want to rant about ideology. So that summer, sometime in June, and people who watch this could find it on YouTube today. I testified in front of Senate Finance, I testified in front of House of Ways and Means and the President's Commission on F Fiscal Responsibility. And I said, here's the data, they solved the problem. But if we could put a chip in the little finger of those 3,500 people, and I hope to God we never do, but if we did, I guarantee you that on November, whatever the day, the first Tuesday in November, this fall, after they've listened to hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising on television and online, pushing them back to their partisan ideology, they will walk into the voting booth and pull the lever in a way that does not solve the deficit problem. And that's what happened. Okay, now I'll try to walk back to Gestalt principles. Number one, the whole community was in the room. And the whole community, so every voice that any elected official would want to point at me and say, but you didn't have any conservative Christians there. Aha, we did. You didn't have any poor blacks there. Aha, we did. You didn't have any highly educated economists there. Aha, we did. Uh, and I'm not trying to be smart ass about it, but so principle of one, if you want to change a public policy in which elected officials, that's the system I'm working in at that moment, time, you can ask, you, you'd have to define the parameters of the values of the system that you're in. Then you have to have the data come from something that is credible and doesn't have any loopholes in it to the people who actually make the decision. Mm -hmm. People I, with I that much- I, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt your, your, your methodology and bring, you're bringing it back to Gestalt, but as I'm listening to you, I can't, help but wondering, you can get 3,500 people to represent America. Why can we not get representative groups of people to train in Gestalt psychotherapy? Well, that's a really, you may not have wanted to interrupt me, but that's, I'll, try, <laughs> I'll respond. I'll re I'll respond. Mm -hmm. um, most Gestalt training institutes have not sufficiently carried the value that representation in the power relationship between teaching and learning is significant enough to have ensured decades ago that we were bringing along people of every representation or every skin color, gender, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we've made progress. I, over time, but if I understood your question, that's why it just wasn't mm -hmm. a high enough value. Yeah, I mean, I just, as I'm listening to your structuring this experiment, the first thing you do is you choose the people who you put in the room so there is representation. And yeah, I think well, that's one of the initial yeah. failings in Gestalt is that our, our, our entry criteria doesn't address okay. a lot of these problems because they're not represented in the room. That fair, fair enough. And, and in this, at least in the United States, in this last COVID period, but I have to catch one thing. We didn't choose the people. We put it out there as a wide net and the people chose themselves. And we monitored as they came in so that we achieved representation. So when we could see that we were missing Hispanic women between the ages of 30 and 50, we knew it was because they didn't have any childcare. So we went to the neighborhoods of Hispanics with women with children and we pay, we got local service, social service agencies to pay for childcare so the Hispanic women could come. So you see what I'm saying? And, and there again, that's an important point in terms of if you wanna change complex systems, you learn to understand why these people aren't participating in what you're offering them. And you then make up the difference so that they are in fact able and feel safe to come. Now, again, I, I, don't, I can't speak for anything other than the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland because I'm not connected and I'm not very much connected there. I left there years ago, but I've been brought back in 
in their, currently they're doing a developmental leadership program in order, one of the highest goals of the program is to increase representation across all the different kinds of programs that are taught at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. And they're doing a fabulous job of it. But that's something that every institute across the world could choose to replicate. They could look at their faculty, they could look at their participants, they could go back over what they did at the Institute was they went back over time to very outstanding people who went through the program, but who were not necessarily interested in being leaders of you know, faculties of training, but went to them and said, look, we need to proliferate this capacity and we need people of color to do it. So we're going to offer you, I, it's a lot of sessions, I think over two years, an opportunity to engage with each other and with us in terms of how more of you would end up in leadership positions in the training programs. It just stood out for me coming back to a very small system with what you were saying you do achieve and what your work is on a larger level. Yeah, it just, I got it, I hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I am aware, I'd be delighted to keep talking to you, uh, hmm. but it is 1240. Yes. <laughs> I have a one o'clock. Yep, um, me too. I, I, I think we should probably think about, is there an elegant way to talk five more minutes and stop? Because I need a break to make a transition out of this space into what I'm doing next. <laughs> yeah, this might be a lot to come into your client with. <laughs> well, it, luckily it's not a client. <laughs> okay. Um, so how does that, that story end? How, what do you come back from that experiment with, I think? Because the question was, what is the essence of your work? And again, I come back to there's a lot of complexity in the essence of your work. Well, I'm going to reframe it a little bit differently. The, mm -hmm. What I was beginning to do with you was saying, how did I manage to embed the really deep gifts that Gestalt can bring to human behavior change and to systems to change, how did I bring more of that into complex systems? In order to do that, I had to at least describe one of the complex systems. And we got to, we, you know, we, we got sort of toward for base on one of them, like how do you get the whole community in the room? And then you had an interest about linking that to Gestalt training, which I was happy to support because I think most of the people listening to this are going to be interested in that. But let me see if in a couple minutes I can give a couple other examples of, oh, this is a good one. So anyone who designs a process, okay, so I'm doing a team building meeting in an organization. I am uh, trying to deal with a community where the toxic waste sites have been all cited in neighborhoods of people of color. Happens all the time. And I'm now working in a system that can either change how team, has a potential to change how team building is done, has a potential to some steps down the road, change how toxic waste dumps are cited. So what are other things from the Gestalt framework that I would ensure were built into the design of how I or the team of people, because in working with these comps, I'm always working with big teams of people. I'm not working with tens of thousands of people by myself. So the principle, in order to do that, you gotta be clear what your goal is, just like you would be in a beginning therapy session. You've gotta be clear about a range of potential outcomes that are meaningful to the various stakeholders. So there's enough belief that what I want out of this system could occur or what my group needs out of the system could actually occur if, I, if we agree to put our minds and hearts and souls into this work. But then the, okay, so I'm standing in front of a room in New Orleans and we're hooked up to five other cities. And in total, there are again, 3,400 or 3,500 people participating. And I see, I can see by virtue of the feedback that's coming back to me, that the step we had planned between 1030 and 11 turns out not to be the right next step because 
the combination of growth at the tables of 10, where people can really authentically talk together. And then we use technology to show every table of 10, what all 3,500 people were thinking. That means in this complex system I'm running, I need to be able to change on a dime and shift what's gonna happen next. All the people who are running technology need to follow me. All the people who are table facilitators ensuring authentic, inclusive conversations at every table have to follow me. So whatever the level of complexity is, an ability to shift on authentically what you now see is the figural data for the majority of people in the room, which happens no longer to be what you thought was gonna be the figural data when you planned the day in my setting. So if you drop that back down to the therapy session, it's pretty easy for therapists to rationalize why I started on this track and I think we should go there even though the client went there and I'm gonna stay like a dog with a bone. And, and sometimes that's even the right thing to do on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But I actually think the more deeply embedded, embody, the more you embody what is most deeply meaningful and authentic about Gestalt, the more capable you are of letting go of what you thought the next step was and either designing yourself or co-creating with whoever's there what the best next step is based on what you've all just learned. So that is at least one more thing. And then you have to follow the principles of closure. You have to, but the, the thing I'm gonna leave you with, and then I really do have to stop. <laughs> the most significant in working in large systems change, if I, and I often put this as a slide in a PowerPoint, and I say to audiences, if you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this. Human beings, are social beings. They respond to the context they're in, the structure they're in, the signals they're receiving in that context. So you can take the same, and this is the example I gave you on debt and deficit, put them in our budget, our economy, and they collectively solve the bloody US debt problem or cut $26 trillion to it put them in the voting booth after they've been ranted at ideologically for four months and they make a bad decision for themselves and for the country. But it's not because they're bad people, it's because everything around them was pushing them to make that decision, wanted them to make that decision. So what I think a lot of Therapists, counselors, group leaders don't think enough about, okay, those of us who are good at therapy, those of us who are good in small groups, those of us who are even good at groups of 100, 300, we see transformative change every time we open our mouths. However, will that transformative change hold? So another principle, remember, I mean, the core gestalt, organism, environment, boundary. Have I built in enough structure for you to stay connected to other human beings who now hold the same value you hold because of the transformative experience we just went through? This is the hardest thing to do in large complex systems because most of we don't control, they go back to their families, they'll go back to their workplace, they go back to an or a large corporation who's headquarters is in a different country, but most people intervening in complex systems and one human being is a complex system, as you well know, don't put enough time, energy or commitment into thinking, okay, this, this is what's possible for transformation when they're operating in the context and structure we created. They are going to leave that context and structure. What is my responsibility as an interventionist to give them some connections and some tools 
to take enough of at least the signal. Maybe it's just one interpersonal relationship, a buddy, so that they survive back out there in the cold, cruel world. <laughs> uh, this is whatever. <laughs> this is whatever. There we go. I well, think this. I think very... this is an upcoming book. It's it's not a simple <laughs> conversation. Well, and I appreciate, I both appreciate you for asking the questions and staying with it. And I appreciate me for trying to do something that's nearly impossible to do in this time frame. in this, but, you know, hopefully a few people will watch it on YouTube and find it helpful. I, I think people will definitely find it interesting. That's for sure. I have really enjoyed getting to know you. This is the first time <laughs> cold call meeting. Yeah. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, yes. And you've left me with you know 500 other questions so i'm sure i'll bother you again sometime so i realize is it okay I, if we uh, leave it for here for the recording for now one more shout out when i said mm -hmm. things that were pushing me toward writing a book i named some names but the person who said i have to do an interview with you is marcy crary so she gets a shout out too oh. okay wonderful a dear, a dear friend wonderful all right well thank you You're so welcome. is it okay for you then if we stop this year absolutely Thanks.